May the peace of the Lord be with you. Blessings and peace to each and every one of you. We are so thankful for this day that the Lord has given us. We will rejoice and be glad in it on behalf of all of the ministers and officers and members of the Greater Grant Memorial African Methodist Episcopal Church. It's my privilege as a pastor uh, to welcome you to our virtual worship service on this fifth Sunday in Lent. We are so thankful for what God is doing in this season, and we are, we are claiming that God is still in control. No matter what's going on in the world, God is still in control. As a result of us being mindful of your welfare and of your health, uh, we are practicing social distancing, and we're not meeting in the sanctuary this morning, but although we are distanced from one, one another physically, we are connected in the spirit, and so we come to this day to praise our God, to worship our God, and to give God all of the glory. Uh, we want to thank each and every one of you, all of our members and all of our friends who have been so faithful and so kind uh, and generous in your giving and supporting of this ministry. And uh, we are thankful uh, that God has made, made us stewards of his resources. Uh, and God has allowed us to be in charge of his resources and we give not out of obligation or uh, we don't give out of necessity, but we give because God loves a cheerful giver. So thank you for all that you have done in support of this ministry. We want to welcome everyone who is worshiping with us uh, virtually through Facebook, through YouTube, to everyone who's on our conference line this morning. Uh, may God bless and keep you. We are excited today about what the Lord is going to do. Just, just want to encourage you to be on the phone with us tomorrow morning at 6.30 on our prayer line. As we continue to pray for our country, pray for our state, our community, pray for our churches, and pray for each other, knowing that God is still in the blessing business. Let me just say this. This is Lent, and Lent is a season about reconciliation. It is a season about restoration, and so we're thankful for what God is doing in this season. As we prepare to worship God today, I just am excited and thankful uh, to present our minister of music, the one who will come and bless us now, someone who is a part of our family that is now reconnected to the family. We give God praise for Minister Daquan Flagler as he comes in his own special way. The Lord's name be praised. You are Alpha and
It's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. And Amen. Uh, from the lectionary scripture of this morning, John chapter number 11, uh, verses 1 through 6. I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Holy Bible. Uh, read along with me, if you will. Uh, the word says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And here's your word. So when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. I want to use this as a subject uh, this morning. It ain't nothing but a setup. It ain't nothing but a setup. The recommendations of the CDC, the state and local health officials for communities all over the country to practice social distancing in an effort to stem the growth and the development of the coronavirus pandemic has caused a significant number of hardships and challenges for every one of us. But I would admit that it has affected me in somewhat of an unexpected way. Uh, certainly the inability for us to gather in the sanctuary as we customarily would for worship every Sunday morning has been a substantially trying experience that has tested our faith and commitment and has forced us to do ministry in diverse and unconventional ways. However, as a person who believes that my greatest impact in ministry is through the gifts of pastoral care, the inability to visit sick and shut-in members, those who are hospitalized or suffering from some, some unknown illness or malady has really caused me to feel a sense of powerlessness and pastoral impotency. Uh, out of all the things I do as a leader of the Greater Grant Church, I can say without hesitancy that my greatest passion and affinity is in the area of pastoral care. 
Uh, my members have heard me testify on many occasions that I may not be the most articulate preacher or the most erudite teacher, but no one will outdo me showing the members whom I'm charged with leading an overwhelming abundance of care, compassion, and consummate pastoral care. For I have come to find that the ministry of pastoral care provides an opportunity for the man or the woman of God, number one, to authenticate the call that you have on your life. Uh, in my experience, I've discovered that some folks choose pastoring as a vocation because they view the role of standing before a crowd or being on TV or Facebook uh, or some other communication medium preaching the word of God as being a glamorous and praiseworthy profession. Uh, some folks may even be attracted by the flair of wearing colorful suits or pointed toe gators or driving luxurious cars as being the epitome of being a successful pastor. But I've come to let you know that you validate your authenticity to your call when your, great, when your greatness is defined by your willingness to serve others. For Jesus said, those who would be great, let them be servants. When you are willing to get up in the middle of the night and go to the bedside of a sick member or when on Saturday evening you still haven't finished Sunday's sermon, but nevertheless, you go and stand by a family that is grieving the loss of a loved mother or father until their need for care has been met. Uh, that's when you demonstrate that the call on your life is real. And sometimes when the folks you are caring for are the folks who've talked about you behind your back, that's when you know that your call is really authentic. Uh, for pastoral care allow, allows us to authenticate our call, but then also it allows us to actualize our call in tangible ways. Uh, in 2017, when my mother went to be with the Lord, I was in the, un in, un in the unenviable position of sitting on the other side of the bed of grief and needing to be ministered to myself. And the members of this church took care of their pastor. And I give God praise for having wonderful, loving members. And, and so I have a personal experience of what it feels like to need someone to pray for you, to encourage you, or just to be in the room without even saying a word. When, when the pastor shows up at the bedside of the room of a member that's going through distress, disaster, or disease, it demonstrates in a very tangible way that ministry is not about fame, it's not about fortune, it's not about glitz, it's not about glamour, but it's about tending to the spiritual well-being of God's people. It is about putting the care of others even before yourself. It, it is a very tangible way that I can say I, I, I care not because I I have to, but I care because I'm called to, because that's what God has charged me to do, because pastoral care helps to, helps to authenticate your call. It helps to actualize your call in tangible ways. But listen, listen to this. It also enables you to actively love as you've been called to do. Uh, but Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you. It is by this that they will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Uh, and the kind of love that Jesus is referring to is agape love, a love that is demonstrated not by what you say, but by what you do. I, I can tell Sister Moss all day long that I love her, but at some point in time, I got to do something that actually actually, actively demonstrates my love for her. All the men in the house say, ow. Your, your, your pastor, your pastor can tell you uh, how much he or she loves you all they want, but if they're not willing to come to the hospital, if, if they don't have the time to come uh, by and offer a prayer when your family is in crisis, or if you call, text, or messenger, or Snapchat, or notice to your pastor uh, that you or your loved one is in a critical condition, and your pastor doesn't even take time to show up, or maybe even not answer your call, something is wrong uh, with the relationship between you and your pastor, because pastoral care is a way by which you can actively demonstrate that you have a genuine love for somebody. Which brings me, which brings me to the tension that I see in the text this morning because, because this tension in the text has called the disturbance in my spirit. For, for the Gospel of John, chapter number 11, begins in verse 1 uh, with these familiar words. He said, now a certain man was sick 
Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. Uh, of course, that's not what disturbs my spirit because we know uh, this man, Lazarus, is not the first person to be identified as being sick. And most certainly the Bible is replete with stories of biblical characters who have been stricken with chronic illnesses. But, but John continues in verse number two uh, to further identify this sick man as not only Lazarus, the one who is ill, but the brother of Martha and Mary, uh, the one who, who, who had anointed the Lord's feet with expensive oil and dried them with her hair. Uh, Bible, Bible readers will recall uh, this reference of the preview chapter number 12, where uh, Lazarus and Mary and Martha are hosting a dinner in Jesus' honor. And in the middle of the dinner, Mary begins to worship the Lord by breaking open a canister of expensive oil, pouring it on the Lord's feet and drying it with her hair. Uh, in other words, in the middle of dinner, Mary decides, I can't wait any longer. I've got to worship the Lord right now. And, and if you don't get anything else uh, that captures your attention for the rest of this message this morning, just hang your hat on this simple thought right here. You don't have to be in a particular place. You don't have to wait on a particular time. You don't have to be in the midst of specific people. But you've got the right right where you are to worship the Lord. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, not only do you have the right to worship God, you got a responsibility to worship God. Come on, saints. We, we're not going to let the fact that we're in virtual space rain on our worship. For God says, I'm seeking those who will worship me in spirit and in truth. He didn't say nothing about worshiping in a building. He said spirit and in truth. And, and I know I'm still in the introduction, but, but can you pause with me right there in virtual space and worship our God? Can, can we give God praise for his goodness? Can, can we just lift our hands and bless God for his kindness? Can, can we tell God, thank you for making ways out of no ways? I, I, didn't, I didn't really know what that meant. My grandmama used to say it all the time. God will make ways out of no ways. Out of, I didn't know until I got out of the house on my own and I found out that sometimes your back will be up against the wall and you don't have no way out, but God will Make a way out of no way. Any, anybody can testify that friends will walk out on you and leave you, but God is a company keeper. He, he's a friend to the friend. It's when, when you're down to your last, he is a provider. Come on, come on. I, I think, I think, I think you got the picture. I see you, I see you worshiping, I see you worshiping. So, so so in verse number one, verse number one, we discover that Lazarus is sick. Verse number two tells us that, that he is the brother of Mary and Martha, and the three of them have some kind of relationship with the Lord. Uh, Jesus, Jesus uh, had a dinner at their house uh, because they had a relationship with the Lord. Then in verse number three, we discover how special the relationship is. Uh, verse number three says, and I'm paraphrasing, since their brother was sick, therefore the sisters sent to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Uh, verse number three makes it clear for us that Lazarus was not just some casual acquaintance with Jesus, but he was someone whom Jesus loved. Uh, and there's one thing, one thing we can say without equivocation that, that love is much more than just a word to Jesus. Uh, for Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus, our, our very commitment to God is qualified by love. Uh, when asked which was the greatest commandment of all, Jesus said, love God with all your heart. Love God with all of your soul. Love God with all of your mind because our very commitment is qualified yeah. by our, our love. But, but then Jesus goes on to suggest that our compassion towards one another hinges on love. Yeah. Uh, for he said, after you demonstrate your depth of love yeah. to God, the second commandment is lacking to it. you you got to love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. As yourself. Can I get a witness in this house? Love, love was more than just a word to Jesus. For the love was demonstrated in, in action. Jesus even, even said that our consistency of our obedience to him is defined by love. For, for he said, you heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, you ought to love your enemy. How, how well are you going to obey my word? Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. It's easy to love folks that love you. But if you're going to be consistently obedient to my word, you got to love folks that hate your guts. you got to love folks that talk about you behind your, your back because even our obedience to God 
uh, is defined by love. Love was more than just words for Jesus. For Jesus is even convinced that our cause for redemption was centered on love. For God so loved the world and that he gave his only begotten son. Therefore, greater love has no man than this, yes, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Yes. And Jesus was obedient even unto the cross because he loved us just that much. So, so text the text uh, here in verse number three uh, says that Mary and Martha sent word to Jesus uh, that behold, the one whom you love is sick. I, I, I love I love that word behold in the King James Version of the Bible, or in the Greek it's the word adua, which, which means you ought to pay attention to this. It means that, that something important is about to be said yeah. behind this. Behold, yeah. behold. Uh, grandmama, you may have heard grandma say it like this, look at him now. Yeah, yeah look, look at him now. Je Jesus gets the word in verse number three. Uh, look at him, that the one you love is sick. Uh, in verse number five, the text affirms that, that he not only loved Lazarus, but he also loved Mary and Martha too. Uh, but, then, but then in verse number six, uh, in my estimation, the text takes an unexpected turn and says, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Uh, I, I, don't mean, I don't mean to trouble you too long this morning, but, but can I just jog back to the opening of the introduction just, just for a second? For, for, for the greatest part, being a pastor for me is pastoral care. I love pastoral care. It gives me the opportunity to demonstrate in a tangible, a sacrificial, and a loving way that I'm a true shepherd. Yeah. And everything that I do is modeled after Jesus, who is the good shepherd. Yeah. You, you remember John number 10. Uh, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, for the good shepherd gives his life. Or the sheep. When, when the wolf comes and, and the hired man, he runs away at the sign of danger because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd not only loves the sheep, but he knows his sheep. And his sheep know him. The, those, those are some bold words coming from Jesus in chapter number 10. Uh, but in chapter number 11, when you are put to the test and summoned to the bedside of your sick friend, Lazarus, the one who you say that you love so much, you stayed two days yeah. in the place yeah. where you were. I, I was troubled. I was troubled by that. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I said earlier, it disturbed, it disturbed me. I, I'll even go as far as to say I'm a little annoyed by the actions of my hero in ministry, yeah. Jesus the Christ, who sets the bar real high for me. Uh, in relative, in, in, in relationship to pastoral care. So, so I had to know what was the deal. And, and as, as folks in Bible study would tell you, I, I believe that my God is big enough. He's secure enough for me to question him every now and then. So, so I asked the text. I said, what gives here, Jesus, with, with you ignoring the pleas of pastoral ministry at the sick bed of Mary and Martha and their brother? Lazarus and, and, and the spirit spirit spoke to me in the midst of the study room uh, he said tan is just a setup that's, that's all it is it's, it's, just, it's just a setup I, I know you can't see it here in chapter number 6 uh, uh, in, in verse number 6 but it's, it's really it's really nothing but a setup so I said Holy Ghost you, you can't leave me here you can't leave me hanging like that I need, I need to let know a little bit more and so, and so the spirit said to me first of all the sickness of Lazarus had a divine purpose he said the sickness, the sickness has divine purpose. It was not by happenstance that Lazarus got sick. It, uh, for, the, for the text said, now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany. Whatever virus, whatever condition, whatever was going on in his body, whatever was circulating at the time, uh, it didn't make Mary sick. It, it didn't make Martha sick. It didn't make any of the neighbors sick. But, but a certain Lazarus got sick. Uh, the name, the name Lazarus is from the Greek word uh, uh, Eleazar, which means in the Hebrew, uh, it means in Hebrew, not Greek. It means, it means, it means God is my helper. Uh, even, even Lazarus' name is suggesting uh, that God has something setting up right here. For in verse number four, Jesus told his disciples, "This sickness is not unto death, but it is for the glory of God." that God's Son might be glorified in it. In other words, uh, God would reveal God's self to humankind in a manner that man could only understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. God, God is getting ready to reveal God's self 
the humankind in a manner that humankind could understand. Yeah, come on, Bible readers, go with me now. You remember in Exodus chapter number 33, Moses said to God, Lord, I need some assurance that you're with me. I need some assurance as I'm trying to lead these children of Israel. And God said, I'll show you that thing that you ask of me, Moses. And Moses said, Lord, show me your glory. Come on, y'all remember, he said, show me your glory. And God said, you can't handle, you can't handle my glory. My glory is too awesome. My glory is too powerful. My, my glory, you can't look at my face uh, and, and live Moses. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to hide you in the cliff of a rock. I'm, I'm going to hide you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let, let my glory pass by. And, and then I'm going to remove my hand so you won't see my glory, but you'll see my back. You'll, you'll see a representation of the glory, but here in this text, God wants to show them all of his glory, but, but, but he, he, he's going to do it through his son, Jesus Christ, and, and so he causes sickness to come upon Lazarus. Uh, 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 to suggest, to suggest that this is just a setup, just a setup, so God can show, show His His glory. Uh, I, 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 can, can you just imagine uh, yourself right now touching a couple of people and saying, "Lord is my helper." Yeah, Lord is my helper, and and if I trust God, I'll see His glory. If if I have faith in God, He'll He'll do miracles. If I lean and depend on Him, He'll prop me up on every side, even in sickness. God has divine. Purposes. He, he is working stuff out for our good. Even though we may not understand it, we know that God is faithful. David said like this, God is our refuge and our strength. Yeah. A very present help in the time of trouble. Thank you, thank you, David, because, because you led me right into yeah. the next point. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, Lazarus' sickness uh, had divine purposes. Uh, but Jesus wants us to know my love for Lazarus uh, was not restricted by time. Yeah, yeah, casual perusal of text uh, may, may give some readers the impression uh, that if Jesus had jumped up and left when he first got word that Lazarus was sick, uh, that he may have arrived before Lazarus died. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I may have alluded to that uh, myself in a previous sermon when I preached. And I, I talked about how Martha got all uh, in Jesus' face when he finally did uh, come and said, if you had been here, uh, my brother would not have died for. But when Jesus, when Jesus did arrive in verse 17, it informs us that Lazarus had already been dead four days yeah. in the grave. But, 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 but if we venture, if we venture, if we venture back to chapter number 10, uh, verse number 40, we find uh, that the last place we find Jesus is with John, who was baptizing on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, uh, yeah, read, read that for yourself when you get a chance for, for the journey from the far side of the Jordan to Bethany, where Lazarus was, was a 15-mile walk uphill, moving from 13 feet below sea level to 2,500 feet above sea level. And, and considering that this was at least a full day's journey, even if the messenger had got on his feet real quick and got to Jesus in a day, and Jesus had started coming back uh, that very same day, it would have took two days for him to get there. And when he got there, Lazarus would still be dead two days. Come on, come on, check my math, check my math. If, if I want to make sure I'm correct, even, even if Jesus had took off when he got the message, Lazarus would have still been dead two, two days. So Jesus needs for us to understand uh, that the matter of time is not a factor in the life of that scenario of Lazarus' sickness. Can, can I put my political hat on uh, just one minute? Some Somebody who, whose name uh, I won't call, as a matter of fact, I won't even call uh, their number. Uh, uh, it, it appears to be attempting to manipulate timelines when, 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 when the things in the United States will get back to normal, saying that he expects the country to be back in business by Easter. But can I tell you, God moves in his own time. God heals in his own time. You can't manipulate God. You can't maneuver around God. You can't bribe God. Because God moves in his own perfect timing. Because we operate in chronos time. That, that, is, that is the time that's on the clock. The, the, the time that's measured by the ticking of the hand. But, but God, God operates in kairos time. Kairos time is perfect time. It's divine time. It's, it's a time when everything is aligned perfectly in order for 
of Jesus. I, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but somebody in the house, somebody virtually, somebody on Facebook, somebody on YouTube. You've been waiting on God to do some stuff for a mighty long time. And can I encourage you that God is still working it out for you? God is still moving in your situation. God is still working behind the scenes. And in God's time, everything is going to be all right. Somebody ought to say yeah. In God's time, all the conditions will be set in place. In God's time, the right people will be where they need to be. In God's time, resources will be made available. That's Kairos time. God's time is working everything out for good. God knows you're waiting. God knows that you're anxious. God knows that you think you've abandoned him. He's abandoned you. But can I let you know uh, that God sees and hears everything you're going through. God knows that Mary and Martha are grieving. God knows that, that, that all of the mourners are criticizing him. Uh, when he comes in, they're saying, look at him over there weeping. He, he could have could have come and healed their brother on time. As a matter of fact, we heard, we heard about uh, we heard about some centurion soldier that came to Jesus and, and said, You don't even have to come to my house if you just speak the word. Anybody know that the Lord can speak the word and you can be healed? And, and so after Jesus has waited two days, he told his disciples, let's go to Judea. For our friend Lazarus is sleeping, and we go there to wake him up. The disciples tried to persuade Jesus not to go uh, because the religious leaders were threatening to stone him. So, so they said, if Lazarus is asleep, surely he will wake up. But Jesus, Jesus said, Lazarus is dead. Yeah. And I'm glad for your sake Mama. that he is. Wow. Yes, yes. That's kind of cold. Yeah, talk, talk about not being pastoral. Je Je Jesus not only didn't move when he discovered that Lazarus was sick, sick, but now he proclaimed that I'm glad Lazarus is dead. I'm glad. That, that, last thing, last thing I believe the Lord wants us to know from this text is that my use of Lazarus was a foreshadow yeah. of things to come. Je Jesus wants us to know uh, this morning, that everything that has transpired thus far in this sickness of Lazarus is just a setup. Uh, for down, down through history, the Lord, uh, he's been, been mighty good at setting stuff up. Uh, he brought children of Israel out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and he took them the way of the Red Sea. He, he could have easily left them uh, an easier way, but he needed them to have the sea in front of them. And to have Pharaoh's soldiers behind him, it, it wasn't nothing but a setup. Yeah. So God could show his power by opening up the Red Sea. Come on, come on, church, I need some help right here. Yeah. I, I feel you, I feel you in virtual space. You, you remember the three Hebrew boys. Young, yeah. Yeah, 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 young folks, let me just drop this in your spirit. That's why it's important to be in church school, because you learn some Bible stories that encourage you for your whole life through. Never, never can never made a statue of gold and put it out on the plains of Dura, and he told the people of Babylon, when you hear the sound of the musical instruments, I command everybody to bow down. Ne Nebuchadnezzar, uh, the Nebuchadnezzars of the world, uh, didn't just start demanding folks to bow down to them uh, when he said in, in order for the governors to get supplies uh, during this uh, pandemic, you got to be nice to me. Uh, yeah, yeah, you, you'll get that when you get to the kitchen. Yeah, yeah, come on, church. There, there's nothing new under the sun. What, well, what's so disheartening uh, is, is, is that some folks who, who purport to be people of faith are still bound down to idol gods. But, but the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we won't, we won't bow down to idol gods. Never, Nebuchadnezzar said, uh, if you don't bow down uh, to me, I'm, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace. And, 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 and just because you, you disobeyed me, uh, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to turn it up seven times, 
seven times hotter. I, I tell you, Nebuchadnezzar is still doing his dirt right now because I heard somebody say uh, uh, that, 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 that just because uh, you won't agree with me, Dr. Fauci, uh, on this Easter timeline, I'm going to turn up uh, the furnace seven times hotter. But I heard, I heard the three Hebrew boys said, we will never bow down because we serve a God who is able yep. to deliver us. And, and even, even if he doesn't, we can go ahead and praise him that he's still able. I, I, need, I need some help right here. I, I need you just to tell your neighbor, don't touch him, but just tell him it is just a setup. Uh, because after, after uh, the three Hebrew boys uh, went into the fiery furnace, uh, Nebuchadnezzar said, I thought I threw three of them in there, but I see four walking around, and it looks like one of them is the Son of God, because it was just a setup for God to show up and for God to get glory. It was a setup for God to just demonstrate one more time that I got not some power, but I got all power. Bible readers will remember uh, Daniel in the lion's den. Uh, it was just a setup uh, so that God could show uh, that he's got control uh, even over the animals uh, in the forest. Uh, David said, I'm going to go against that big giant uh, named the lion uh, because I don't come under my own power. Uh, because I come under the power of Almighty God. Everybody was looking at him, wondering in amazement what gave this little shepherd boy the courage to go against the lion. I come to let you know it was just a setup so that God could show up and show the world that he has all power in his hand. Y'all come on, go with me down to Jericho walls. I can see Joshua right now walking around doing something that sounds completely ridiculous. Is there anybody here know that God will call us to do the ridiculous just so he can show us that he's got all power. I can see Joshua walking around and shouting at the walls after seven days and seven times. He began to give a shout and the walls came down because his shout was just a setup to show God's power. I, Jesus wanted them to know that Lazarus being dead four days in the grave was nothing but a setup. It was a foreshadow of something that was to come. It was a foreshadowing of a miracle that is yet to come. It was a foreshadowing of God getting ready to do the unheard of. It was a foreshadowing of God doing the unthinkable and the unimaginable and the unbelievable. I can see Jesus right now walking into Bethany, being met by Martha, who said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. But Jesus said, your brother shall live again. She said, I know that he's going to live again in the resurrection. But Jesus said, I am, I am, I need a little help right now. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And he that liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Do you believe it? I'm talking to you today, church. Do you believe that he is the resurrection? If you believe he's the resurrection, tell your neighbor it's just a setup because I feel God is getting ready to resurrect some stuff in my life. God is getting ready to bring me out of crisis. God is getting ready to turn my situations around. God is getting ready to visit me in deserted places and let me know that everything is going to be all right. I heard Joseph say that I once was in the pit, but the Lord has brought me to the palace and my brothers and my sisters. I need for you to know that what the enemy meant 
for evil. God will. Y'all ain't helping me today. God will. Turn around for good. Touch your neighbor in visual space and say, Lord, turn it around. Turn around my situation. Turn around my family life. Turn around my problems at home. Turn around my financial situation because the Lord is able to turn it around. And I believe right now that God is getting ready to get glory out of your story. Wave your hand and tell God thank you. Lord, I can't see it right now. God, I can't feel it right now. God, I feel sick in my body. But I believe your word is true. That you are a miraculous God. So now, under him who is able to do abundantly, exceedingly, and beyond anything I can ask, I'm going to praise you in advance because the Lord can work things out. Everything you're going through, it is a setup for God to make a way. It's a setup for God to bless you. You are blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed in the home, blessed in the streets, blessed in your community. Say yeah, say yeah. I believe, I believe that everything is going to be all right. That's why the hymn writer said, be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings, your love abides. God will take care of you. If you believe, God is able. Wave virtually from Facebook. Wave virtually through YouTube. Tell God, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's just a setup. It's just. It's just. It's just a setup. Just a setup. It is a foreshadowing of that which is to come. For all of us who have over and over been blessed by this and never chapter of John, we know ultimately that Jesus goes to the tomb. Tell them to remove the stone. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And in his grave clothes, Lazarus walks out alive. And the Lord says, now loose him and set him free. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a foreshadowing. It's, it's a foreshadowing. It's a miracle. That 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 uh, that is a model for even a greater miracle. Uh, because as we're now heading next Sunday to the triumphant entry of Jesus uh, on what we call Palm Sunday, and then we'll be led into Good Friday. When I say they will be crucified, suffer and bleed and die on the cross. We'll be buried in a borrowed tomb. But early yes. Sunday morning, he's going to get up with all power. Because it's all a setup to show God's miraculous power and the fact that the grave has no authority. And for those of us who believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that that, that same Jesus, while I was in the club, that, that same Jesus, while I was doing my dirt, that same Jesus, while I was in my sin, died just for me. If I would have been the only one on earth, he still would have died because he loved me. 
So the Lord, the Lord, the Lord today, he's letting you know that everything you've gone through has been a setup. It's been a setup just for him to extend himself and extend his invitation and extend his heart to you. He says, come unto me, you who labor, you who are heavy burdened, you who are going through crisis, you who are going through trouble, you who are going through tribulation, ye who are about to give up hope. Come, come, come. Cast all your burdens upon me, and I'll give you rest. If you're, if you're here today, listening wherever you may be, and, and you don't know this wonderful, loving Christ Jesus, the one that loves you unconditionally, the one that died and suffered for you, I invite you now to pray with me. Pray this prayer. Lord, I thank you that you kept me this far. I come understanding, God, that I am a sinner, as we were all sinners. And God, I realize that the wages of sin is death separation from you. But the gift of life, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And so this day, God, I make a declaration that I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you my all. Welcome me into your heart. And by virtue of your word and the faithfulness of your word, I know that I'm saved. Amen. Now, now you prayed that prayer. You prayed that prayer. And, 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 and I, I need for you to know that if you pray sincerely, the Lord has already come into your heart. The sun is going to look the same tomorrow. The moon is going to look the same tomorrow evening. But what has changed is you on the inside. And day by day, you're going to grow closer and closer in your walk. So, so you need to find a good church, a Bible-based church, a praying church, a loving church. And you need to get in it. And you need to let the Lord teach you and grow you. I extend an invitation. If you don't have a church home, you may come to the Greater Grant Church, 5533 Gilchrist Road, here in Jacksonville, Florida, where I am the pastor and I'm surrounded by a wonderful staff of ministers and officers and members and we want to love you. We want to embrace you. We want to help you go closer with the Lord so that we might all one day have that great resurrection morning. Amen. Amen. I want to thank each and every one of you today and I want to encourage you as, as we are continually um, worshiping through virtual medium, uh, by Facebook and by YouTube, uh, that you would be so kind as uh, to give uh, your offering, your investment in the ministry of this church. Uh, you may do so uh, by our various mediums, Give Plus. Uh, we will have the cash app up this week, uh, as well as you may write a check to your, um, put it in your tithing envelope and mail it to the church. Or if, if all else fails, someone, your class leader, will come by and pick it up. Amen. Amen. May God bless you and may God keep you is our prayer from the Greater Grand Church. In the name of Jesus, we pray.